Our sound system this week is uh, kind of thrown together more so than most weeks. Um, we, uh, our, our sound techs uh, weren't able to pull off our normal system this week. So thank you for putting up with uh, a not as good sound system as, as we've been accustomed to. Um, Dan Britt shared at the beginning of our service and I don't know if you could hear him, uh, but we did record him uh, on the phone here. Uh, we had him mic'd up. So if you want to go back and listen to him, um, basically Dan's been an elder for several years. He's actually gone beyond the term that we ask an elder to, uh, to uh, serve. And, um, and I mistakenly said, so what do we do with guys that want to serve longer? Like, should we let them serve longer? And then Dan thought about it for a bit and, and, um, and Dan, Dan realized uh, he's got so much physically going on. You'd never know it unless you know Dan well. But he, he's uh, suffering physically in a lot of ways. And, and Dan realized that because of those limitations, it, it's, it's time for him to step down. So I would encourage you to go back online and, and, and watch that. But let, uh, let me pray, and then we'll, we'll dive into our, our passage here. Lord, we love you, Jesus. Uh, it, is, it is hot right now, Lord. And, and I, I would just pray that um, the heat... Um, would not distract us from uh, the truth in your word, the truth about uh, you, the truth about your church, and, and what, what, what we get to do in your name, Lord. So we, uh, we pray for this time, that, that our hearts and minds would be yours, that you would transform us um, by, by, uh, by hearing your word, by listening to the teaching of your word, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let me read to you. Uh, this is First uh, Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, if you have your Bibles. It says, as you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honors for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumbled because they disobeyed the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once... You were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter, as we're in uh, his letters, you realize that Peter loves the Old Testament. He quotes from the Old Testament left and right, makes allusions to the, the Old Testament. And here he's drawing on language and imagery from the Old Testament when he writes about Christ, this living stone, the cornerstone that he's built us up. Uh, the, like living stones, we're being built up into this spiritual house. And there's no shortage in the Old Testament of places to read about stones, about rock. We, through First and Second Samuel, we talked about uh, God being the rock. Even Peter's name. If you look at Peter's name, Jesus gave him a new name, and this name means rock. Maybe you remember in Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel was, was exiled and serving under this foreign king. Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream. And it troubled him. It was unsettling. He demanded that, that his wise men, his, his counselors, his magicians, his enchanters, that they interpret the dream. They said, no problem, we'll do that for you. Um, just tell us the dream. And he said, no, I know that you're going to try and trick me. Like, you know what the interpretation is. You not only need to interpret the dream for me, but you need to tell me what my dream was. And of course, they couldn't. But God had provided through Daniel. And Daniel came to him and, and, and told him the dream. He said, and I'm paraphrasing here, obviously, that you saw this great image. You saw uh, an image and the, the head was of gold. The, the chest and the arms were made of silver. The, 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 the middle and, and the, the thighs were made of bronze. And the feet were, were partially clay, partially iron. He said that King Nebuchadnezzar, that head of gold is you. The, the, the other precious metals are other kingdoms that, that will come and go. But the stone, the stone uncut by human hands, this is the kingdom of God, the stone that will come and, and crush the feet. This is the kingdom of God and it will have no end. God was promising that his kingdom would come and, and be forever. 
and we could go on and on uh, about the use of, of stones in the Old Testament. Peter is going to quote from Isaiah. He'll quote from the Psalms. Uh, Jesus in Luke 20, he, he's dealing with some scribes and Pharisees that are trying to give him trouble. He tells a story about uh, tenants that, that are renting this vineyard from the owner. And ultimately, these tenants kill the property owner's son. The, the owner wants to collect on, on, on the rent, right? The fruit from the vineyard. And, and they, they, they uh, abuse the, the servant that he sends. And, and finally, the owner says, okay, I'm going to send my son. They will respect him. But instead, they see this as an opportunity. They kill the son thinking that they, that they will somehow now be the, the owners of the property. And Jesus says, what's the owner going to do? He's going he's gonna to give this, this vineyard to someone else. Right? Jesus is, is the last in a long line of people sent to Israel by the Lord to call the tenants to account. Jesus is telling them that just because you're Israel, that doesn't mean you're right with God. If you reject the son sent by the father, the kingdom will be given to another. And then Jesus quotes what, what Peter will quote here from the Psalms uh, about the stone that the builders rejected. And then in 2018, there's, there's an allusion to Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Jesus says, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. When it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And what Jesus does right there is, is he takes this rich imagery of, of stones, he applies it to himself. As one commentator wrote, he was saying that he was the fulfillment of these promises. Jesus, the stone uh, that lives are built upon, uh, they're either built upon to, to live forever or they're broken to pieces by. There's, there's no in between. Jesus is this chosen, precious cornerstone. We either reject him and, and throw him away, or he is everything to us. He's your treasure. He's the foundation of your life. So our truth statement for a passage today is, God has chosen us as a royal priesthood to proclaim his wonderful deeds as the one who called us by his mercy. I'll say that again. God has chosen us as a royal priesthood to proclaim his wonderful deeds as the one who called us by his mercy. So again, back in verse 4 of our passage in 1 Peter. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And when he says you here, this isn't uh, just us individually Right? We, we come from an individualistic culture. We, we carry our individualism into the text as we read Scripture. But he's talking to you, the church, you, God's people. He's talking to the community of believers. And he tells us what happens when we come to Christ, who is that living stone. That Christ takes his, his people, who, who are like living stones, patterned after him. And he's building them into this spiritual house. Right? And I picture, I picture the, the temple, and Paul writes in a way similar to that in Ephesians 2. He says that we're built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in him whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Right? The temple was was the building that housed the presence of God. God's people could be near him because his, his presence was in the temple. But for these early readers of this letter, they weren't near Jerusalem. Right? They weren't near the temple. And, and now they're being told that God has built this temple not of lifeless rocks, but of his people that are like living stones. And Peter calls it a, a spiritual house. And I think it's helpful for us to picture it that way because Peter keeps talking in, in family language. He's shaping our identity as God's people. That we're part of God's family and he's taking us and together he's building this spiritual house where he dwells. But not only are we the temple, he tells us, but we're this holy priesthood, right? a priest mediated between God and man. Humanity needed a mediator because of sin. And the priests would come and offer all these sacrifices, uh, make these offerings to God 
for the people to atone for sin. Now, if we hadn't read the passage yet, and I asked you, do we make sacrifices to Jesus today? My guess is I would see some squirming in chairs, trying to think through, man, do we make sacrifices? And and maybe I would get a sheepish yes, Uh, but Peter tells us that, that we do. And these spiritual sacrifices are acceptable to God through Christ. Right? There's no other way but through Jesus. There are people that talk about being spiritual or they talk about being religious. And, and you can be as religious as you want. You can be as spiritual as you want. You can believe that there is a God. You can believe that judgment is real, that you need to be reconciled. But if you don't place your faith in Christ... There are no spiritual sacrifices that will be accepted. There are no practices, no good deeds that God accepts. It's Christ or nothing. We all know John 14, 6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So Christ is our precious cornerstone. He's the only way that spiritual sacrifices will be acceptable to God. And and I hope, I hope that we realize how truly precious this cornerstone is. Praise God for sending his son to be our cornerstone. So what are these sacrifices? Let me read a few different verses from the New Testament. Romans 12, 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual worship, right? We, as a believer, we're to present our whole self to God as a sacrifice, right? No no part of us gets left off the altar. During my second semester of my freshman year uh, at Multnomah Bible College, I'm sitting in a class. We're about half hour into the first day of class and it's the the syllabus is being explained and kind of just the basics of how the class works is being explained. And, And then a guy raised his hand, teacher called on him and he said, what do I need to do to get a C? And the prof, looked at him funny and we kind of all laughed awkwardly because it was super weird and, and, and I think the prophet said excuse me he said I just want to know what do I need to do to get a C and, and I wonder how often we approach following Christ like that I, I think all of us tend to to say man what how much of myself do I really have to give to God Paul tells us it's everything this is a sacrifice Hebrews thirteen fifteen says through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. When we speak praises to God, it's a sacrifice. It's an offering to the Lord. Lips that acknowledge the goodness of God, the greatness of God. It's a fragrant aroma to him. When we share about Jesus with people that do not know him, that's a sweet aroma to the Lord. The very next verse, Hebrews 13, 16 says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Our good works done by the power of the Spirit, these please God, these are sacrifices to him. Us blessing others with what we've been blessed with is a sacrifice that God likes. I'll throw in 1 Corinthians 10, 31 as well. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And there are more sacrifices that we could talk about, but these are some of the sacrifices that that the priesthood brings. Let's keep going. Verse 6, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a precious stone. Uh, a cornerstone chosen and precious and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame right this is from uh, the book of Isaiah Israel had a history of terrible leaders sinful men that did not lead them to God they in fact led them away from God and God was promising that he would make a sure foundation upon this cornerstone Right? And that if you put your trust in this cornerstone, his promise is that you will not be disappointed. And the cornerstone was, was the first stone set. It, it was the most important stone. Everything was based off of that stone. Obviously, it's, it's in the corner, so the angles of the walls are, are based off that stone. The, the levelness of, of the whole wall, the building, is based off that stone. So if you trust this chosen precious stone, meaning that he's the foundation of your life, he says you, you will not be put to shame. You'll not be disappointed. This is a guarantee. And it doesn't mean that there won't be great disappointment in this life. 
right? There will be great times of pain and hardship, but in eternity there will not be a moment of disappointment. Instead, we will proclaim to him how worthy he is, right? We will tell Jesus that he was worthy of every moment of hardship, that he was worthy of all suffering from persecution, worthy of any sacrifice that we made for the kingdom of God. The beginning of verse 7 says, so the honor is for you who believe. And it's easy to see why Peter wrote verse 6. It's very encouraging to believers. And and even the first little bit there in verse 7, but then it goes on. It says, but for those who do not believe, this stone, the stone that the builders rejected, has become the cornerstone. Verse 8, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumbled because they disobeyed the word as they were destined to do. Those are hard words to read in Scripture. It's great to read about believers being chosen, but we know the opposite means that uh, there are others who are not chosen. And and I think verse 8 helps us see how complex this is, that there is personal responsibility on the one hand that that people will be accountable for. They, They stumble because they disobey the word, right? They reject the gospel. They reject Christ. And then it says, as they were destined to do. And we probably don't like that a person could be destined to reject Christ. But I think Peter's helping us see here. He's reminding us that even though people have rejected this cornerstone, it does not thwart God's plan. That this is actually part of God's plan. It was part of God's plan for the Pharisees to stir up the crowds and shout crucify. It was part of God's plan for the soldiers to carry out the savage beatings of Christ in the crucifixion. And I'm sure in that moment, everyone that loved Jesus wondered, God, why are you letting this happen? I don't fully understand, but I trust that God is good in this complex situation, that somehow people are responsible for their response to Jesus and they are destined. I understand, though, that that for some of you, this might really drive you crazy. This might, this might be one of the harder uh, things for you in Scripture, in, in following God. And I would just say, I, the, the elders, any one of us, we would love to get together with you and, and, and talk with you through this. And I'm not promising that we'll have all the answers, but we'd love to look through Scripture together. We'd love to pray with you. If you'd like to, Peter would love to get together. Pastor Gary would. I would. We'd love to just wrestle through this with you. Let's keep moving, though. Verse 9. It says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And notice he says, this is who you are. God has done this. And obviously in one sense, this is happening as he's saving more and more people. He's adding to his people, but it's also something he's already accomplished. He has made us a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. It's interesting to read that word race right now with everything that's going on. And to see that this way that he's talking about race is different. This is different than the way we think of it. This race isn't defined by skin pigment or culture or country of origin. No, God's gathering people from every culture, from every language, from every country of origin to be his chosen race. He tells us that we're a royal priesthood. and I love that not only are we the the spiritual house, but, but we're also the priests. We're active participants in making sure that God is worshipped the way he should be. Now, uh, my guess is that you make some assumptions about me as a pastor and and how I go about my week and how, uh, probably especially how I prepare for Sundays. You assume that I've prayed probably a lot. You assume that I've studied. You've, you assume that, that I've spent time preparing my heart and my mind. Uh, you can probably guess what my Saturday night is like. It's probably different than yours. Right? I, I spend a lot of time in prayer. I spend a lot of time going over the sermon. In many times, in many ways, I ask God to help me. I fall asleep thinking about something to do with Sunday morning when I wake up. It's almost always the first thought on my mind. And you expect these things because I'm a pastor. 
And Peter tells us that if you have come to Christ, you are priests. So what would you expect of a priest? I think we would expect that a priest would have a vibrant prayer life, regularly coming before God. I think we would expect someone who comes to God's word and meets with the Lord and, and, and knows the word and, and applies the word to their life, right? They, they don't just know it, but they live it out. I think we would expect a priest as a person who longs for people to know God, to be made right with God. I think we would expect a life of sacrifices and devotion. We would expect a holiness, right? And that's, that's what he says. He says, you're a holy nation, which helps us understand in, in uh, chapter 1, verse 15, when he says, that, hey, because God is holy, you're to be holy. I'm going to quote Matt Q. I think he's here somewhere from a couple weeks ago. He said, holiness is not about what we do, but about what God does to us and through us. We're holy because God has made us holy. It's not because of what we have done. Our holiness is because of what Christ has done. So we do not want to mar this holiness that Christ gives us. So a moment ago, I asked you what you would expect of a priest and I think when we, when we think about holiness and what God has done in us, maybe we should ask, what do we not expect to be a part of a priest's life? We wouldn't expect a priest to uh, pursue habitual sin. We wouldn't expect a priest to be entertained by unholy things or have a mind that, that just lingers in sinful thoughts. We wouldn't expect a priest to be preoccupied with wealth or to be dishonest. We wouldn't expect a priest to have a lack of care for others. Last week we talked about loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, I'm sure there's probably other things that, that you can think of that we would not expect to be a part of a priest's life. But God has made us holy, so why do we mar the holiness that Christ has accomplished in us? He says that we're a people of his own possession, right? We are his. And, and it says he's, he's called us out of darkness into marvelous light. Verse 10 says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you'd not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This comes from Hosea, right? Hosea was a prophet. God told him to marry a woman that would not be faithful to him. She lived as a prostitute. And Hosea had kids with this woman. And God names these kids. And if you ever wish your parents would have named you something differently, you have nothing to complain about. One of his kids' names meant unloved. Another kid's name meant not my people. Right? Israel was choosing to be unfaithful, like, like Hosea's wife. And God let them. He, he let them wander. He said, you, you're not my people. But God would not let it stay that way. He promised that he would save a remnant. And God has made us his own. He did not let us live in our rebellion. In his mercy, he has made a way for everyone who responds to him to be saved from sin. And he did this by sending Christ to be the sacrifice so that when we trust in Christ, that we can be forgiven. He's done the work as we respond by believing. There was a, a viral video, I don't know if you saw it this week, of a boy named Jordan in Oklahoma. I think he's nine years old. It was a news story. Jordan lives in a group home. He's been in this home for six years. His uh, little brother uh, was with him in that home for several years. Last year, he was adopted. And Jordan, uh, I mean, the story was pretty long. And Jordan was just such a, he's such a sweet boy. Uh, certainly been through a lot in his young life. And they asked him several questions, but the one that caught my attention was they said, Jordan, if you had three wishes, what would you wish for? He said, a family, family, family. Someone I could go to anytime I want. A mom and a dad, or just a mom, or just a dad. And I'm watching this video, and it just tears my heart up for this kid. He just wants to have a family. And then a couple days later, I saw a follow-up article that over 7,000 families have already applied to adopt uh, Jordan. And I just thought, man, God has made us his own. Right? This, is, this is why Peter keeps telling us that we've been chosen. Chosen is, is meant to encourage believers. God didn't need to choose anyone, but by his mercy, he's made us a people. He has adopted 
all these people who are now brothers and sisters in this massive family. And this is what he says that, that, that this chosen race, this royal priesthood, this holy nation does. He says that you, right, we, the church, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And God has made us this way so that we could proclaim to the world how great he is. The one who has taken us from being dead in sin, trapped in darkness, into his marvelous light, into eternal life with him. One person wrote it this way. They said, he has made us who we are so that we could tell the world who he is. And we know, believers, that this, this is our job. Right? We know that this is what the world needs, that people need to hear the gospel. Right? They can't just have Christians in close proximity to them that are really nice people, right? that, are, that are good co-workers or classmates. No, they need, they need Christians who will talk with them about Jesus, who will explain the gospel to them, who will take the risk. And this is what God's chosen people have been made to do to tell the world. And I wonder how, how are we doing that harvest? Are we hoping that there will be some other Christians that will be really bold? Are we counting on super Christians at work, in our neighborhood, in our class, or on our team to share about Jesus? Or do we really view ourselves as priests and take that role seriously? That we would, uh, we would help mediate between God and man. That we would help bring people to God. Do we recognize the unfathomable mercy of the Lord in sending his only son? Last week, if you were with us, I asked you to picture, as we were talking about loving brothers and sisters in Christ, and I talked about brothers or sisters in Christ that are hard, uh, hard for us. I asked you to picture, picture a brother or sister and pray about that this week, wrestle with that this week, how, how to love them. And this week, I want you to picture, instead of a brother or sister in Christ, someone who isn't a brother or sister in Christ, someone who needs to hear about Jesus that, that has not trusted Christ yet. And I know that you pictured somebody. I mean, that's just how our brains work. Right? If I told you to picture a pink elephant, y'all just did it. So I know there's, there's someone you know that doesn't know Jesus and I wonder if, if you would spend a week, two weeks, who knows, months praying for them. But I wonder, what does that even feel like right now, just thinking about telling them about Jesus? Is that terrifying for you? Is your first thought that they're so far from trusting Christ? Or, or maybe you doubt that, that you know enough to talk about Jesus. Maybe you imagine them mocking you. Ah, please, please. Start praying because we're a people, right? We're God's spiritual house. We're God's priest, this chosen race, this holy nation. And we've been made to proclaim the excellencies of him. Let's pray. Jesus, we uh, love you, Lord. And, and I confess, God, uh, man, when I was in high school, I was so passionate about telling people about you. And, and something happened over time, Lord. I, I don't know if it's fear I don't know if it's a lack of trust in you. I don't know if it's feeling like I have something to lose. I don't know if it's pursuing the comforts of this world, but, but I've lost so much of the boldness that I once had, Lord. God, will you stir in us a passion for people to know about you, Lord? Would you stir in us a desire for this world to hear the proclamation of how great you are and that we need you, that, that by mercy, you sent your son to die for us so that we could be forgiven. God, would you give us hearts for the lost, Jesus? Lord, would we, would we worship you in our everyday lives? Lord, would we offer ourselves up as that living sacrifice that Paul talked about? Jesus, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.